Welcome to the Mentors and Moguls podcast. I'm your host, Heather Stone. I bring you mentors and moguls from all around the world, different walks of life, from creatives to CEOs, to business leaders, to top athletes, and all kinds of other people in between. If you like our episode today, all of our podcasts are available on our YouTube channel. Please go ahead and subscribe and comment. We'd love to hear your feedback. Today, we are joined by author Nicole Meyer, and we're so excited to have her here. We're going to be discussing her passion, her process, and of course, her product, which is her new book. So welcome, Nicole. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So I just finished your book last night, and I absolutely loved it. I can't wait for your next book, whenever that is. But my burning question is, did you always know that you wanted to be a writer? Is that your true passion? Mm. And at what point did you really decide, I really want to be a writer? This is my calling in life. It's such an interesting question because I have truly always loved books and I've always wanted to write. Um, And I wrote as a child, I had short stories, I didn't really show them to a lot of people. And I read voraciously. Um, And then I went on to college, right? So I studied creative writing and I really enjoyed it. I wrote a ton of short stories in college, but to be honest, I kept a lot of it to me. I kept it hidden. Remember those floppy disks, you know, and the, yes. the laptop computers? Yes, yes, I remember those. So I, I thought that uh, maybe everybody did it or maybe it wasn't special enough or maybe, you know, there was nothing unique to it, but it was definitely something that I loved. And to be honest, I don't know if I had the courage to step out and try something at that point in my life. I didn't think I was special enough, if that makes any sense. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think a, I think a lot of girls, young girls and women, think I've got something great that I love to do. Mm-hmm. And it turns out usually that's your passion. They just didn't know they can turn it into a career. Right. So let's go back to those college days. So you okay. never shared your stories with anyone? You did, was it just for <laughs> you? I mean, it just made you happy to be writing those stories? It made me happy and it was something I was driven to do. I had to do it. It, There wasn't an option. I couldn't keep it inside of me. I needed to put it down on paper um, or on the computer. I had professors that encouraged me. To be honest, I had mostly male professors who assigned male authors in college. And I wish I had that female mentor that maybe took me aside and said, you can do this. This is something that you should pursue for a career. But I didn't really have anybody at that point in my life that I could look up to. Um, And I also didn't know about the environment I need to be in. I thought I had to be somebody funky and cool living in a loft in New York, you know, to be an author. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Um, So that was the one point that was part that was maybe lacking. Um, I didn't have enough self-esteem or courage to put myself out there. And I didn't have that certain female mentor who maybe could encourage me in that direction. So, okay. Well, that's true for a lot of us that we didn't have female mentors. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Okay. So another thing that I'm really curious about, we talk a lot about passion and identifying your passion, Mm -hmm. which you've kind of discussed that with me right now. But let's talk a little bit about your process. It's one thing to say, this is terrific. Uh, I've got a terrific new book and I'm published, but there were a lot of steps in between and I'm sure a lot of sweat and hard work Mm -hmm. and maybe anxiety since you were, where did you find the courage? When did you find the courage? So let's go back and talk a little bit about your writing of your first book. Did you just sit down and say, I want to start writing a book? I mean, how did what did that look like and how did you make a decision that I want to write a book? Right, right. So a lot of it had to do, well, a lot of different factors, I guess. A lot of it had to do with um, turning 40. So I know a lot of women do this as they say, by the time I hit 40, I'm going to realize at least one of my goals. So one of my goals when I was 39 was I'm going to finish a book by the time I'm 40, no matter if one person reads it or 10 people read it. I just wanted to do it because it's something that I secretly wanted to do all my life, but I didn't have the courage to. Um, And then I would say in about 2010, someone took me to a writer's conference in San Francisco and she was much more prepared to start writing a book than I was, but I had something instinctually inside me that said to go with her. And man, I just walked into that room and it was full of writers and agents and publishers. And I felt for the first time in my life, I found my people. (laughs) Oh, I love it. So I immediately went home and started working on my first manuscript, which that novel lives in a drawer right now. That was my practice novel. I had to write that. Okay. But I was so driven to do it, no matter if anyone saw it or not. I just wanted to see if I had what it took to finish a novel. 
So that conference was, that was a great source of inspiration. And then you saw others that were maybe kind of like-minded and that mm-hmm. gave you the courage to go and try it yourself, even yes. though that sits in a, in a drawer. Yeah. Sometimes it takes, that's a good catalyst. Sometimes it takes people of the same mindset or people that are, you know, going through failures and trials and errors, trying to reach that goal. Right. It takes being submersed in that group of people to make you realize I'm just like them. I can do this too they're not succeeding right off the bat. You know, it's, success is not overnight, but they're following a passion. And I just wanted to be a part of that so badly, so. Oh, I love that story. <laughs> well, hopefully that'll be encouraging to a lot of other people that are maybe sitting on the other side of the fence. Right. You know, looking for courage, not thinking that they're enough to right. do something. So I love that challenge. I wanna do this by the time I'm 40. So yeah. that's pretty terrific. So you stuck <laughs> to you again. Yeah. So what happened after that? So you started with your first your first try, your first manuscript, and that's sitting in a drawer. That's sitting in a drawer. Okay, will we ever see that? No, I think that I needed to do that as a practice novel. I need to see if I had what it took to put a whole story together, and I did, but it wasn't, it's not meant to be seen, I think, as just for me to go through the process and learn. I'm still learning, still learning my craft, still evolving, still hoping my writing improves, but book after book, I learn so much more. Um, And to answer one of your original questions, I finished that book and I set it aside. Um, And then I came across my next story, which was my first book that got published. And I felt just driven to write that story. It came very fast um, and it came very easy and it was so fun. And something in me knew that that was gonna be the first book that I'd publish. When you decided to write your first book, did you decide to write your first full novel in the very beginning or did you start with other projects? That's really interesting, too, because I originally thought I'm just going to go out there and write a book. But the reality is I needed to get some experience. I needed to learn a lot about the craft. Mm -hmm. And I actually reached out to another female author and asked for some advice. And she gave me the best advice. I still give this to other writers is all she wrote back was my recommendation is to start small. And when I first got that, I was a little peeved. I said, well, I want to write a book. I don't want to start small. Right. But then I really internalized it and thought, what does that mean to me? So the first thing I did was I got a freelance job for um, a visitors, a travel visitors association online that was in my town. And they asked me to do all their travel stories for them online. Very small pieces. And I learned how to write nonfiction travel stories. Okay. And then I actually started my own travel blog which I would interview um, authors and talk about travel reads. I'd talk about these really great trips I took with my friends or my sisters. Mm -hmm. Um, And then from there, I got offered some more freelance work for um, magazines. I started writing lifestyle pieces and more travel pieces um, and even some art pieces. So I really got my experience and I learned how to work with an editor for the first time, right? So you write this magazine story thinking it's amazing and perfect and you turn it in and the magazine editor (laughs) tears it up and says rewrite a b and c and that taught me a lot right because any artist likes to think that their work is ready to go right out the door but it's not and Mm. you need to learn how to graciously take feedback Mm. and to internalize it and to know that you can always do better so that those were great lessons for me And all along the way, I was chipping away, writing my first novel, Mm -hmm. but I did start small and that is my recommendation to everybody. Okay. So I have, I've watched you because I discovered your travel blog Um, because I saw another gal friend of mine had it and that's how I first discovered (laughs) that you had great writing abilities. But I have watched you grow over the years as well through that blog. So that's interesting. I think it's it's very good for people to know that you just don't jump into your first novel and that's where you start, that you can take baby steps. Baby steps are great. You learn these lessons along the way you just wouldn't learn anywhere else that so. that's valuable information yeah. okay so your first book was the house of bradbury which yeah. i loved oh, we'll talk you. a little bit about that later but <laughs> i love that book thank you but tell me you had a passion to say i'm ready to write this book this mm-hmm. book needs to be published the story needs to be written mm-hmm. But how did it really work behind the scenes? I can't imagine you just sat down and said, I'm going to start writing this book and I'm not getting up until it's finished. Tell me, how how did you do that? How did you even formulate a plan for that? Yeah, the process is so crazy because there was no process, right? With The House of Bradbury, I felt compelled to write that story. And for the first time, it wasn't about, can I get this published? Can I get a literary agent? Can I get attention for this book? It was just the pure desire and actually need to get that story on paper. Mm -hmm. Um, So I wrote that pretty quickly. The story came pretty quickly 
easily to me, but the process after that was not easy. So um, what happened was I pitched it to different literary agencies and they, to be brutally honest, that process of having your book submitted to a literary agency who could then maybe submit it onto a publisher is a long process. It could take up to nine months for an agency to even read the first three pages of your book. Oh, wow. Yeah, so imagine an author just sitting at home, refreshing the keyboard, refreshing email, just waiting for someone to respond or give feedback even. I actually submitted mostly to female literary agents because I felt that they could give me the feedback I was seeking, and some of them did. I will never forget the one female agent who did take a long time, and I thought maybe she'd given up on me to read the manuscript, and she sent me back a very lengthy, detailed, thoughtful email, almost chapter by chapter going through feedback, what she thought of the book, why it worked, why it didn't work. And I didn't wind up signing with her, but I will be forever grateful that she took time out of her schedule to basically give me more feedback than I'd gotten from anybody else in terms of my writing. So that really helped me, truly. And it was a connection. I still connect with her. We still keep in touch, even though she's not my agent, because um, it's a community, right? right? I started to find female um almost mentors, if you will, within the writing community, whether they be an editor or an agent or another author. And that really sort of boosted up my confidence and made me feel a connection with other people that knew what the struggle was like. And I kept going. Okay. So there's a lot of trial and error that comes with publishing a book. It's not overnight. Um, and what happened is I connected with a small press and it was all female run and they um, offered me a contract and published The House of Bradbury. And I just loved it. It was so author-centric and I got a lot of feedback in. They gave me their feedback. They were with me throughout the whole process. And I have to say, it felt really nice to be supported by this company of women that were supporting other women. So I love that you talk about that you were seeking out female publishers and yeah. everyone that you sought out. So that was intentional that you were seeking out female publishers and why did you seek out only female, only female publishers? Why did you just seek out female, female So it publishers? wasn't female publishers necessarily, it was okay. female agents okay. who could um, give me feedback and also represent me. Okay. Um, and then I lucked out with the House of Bradbury because I wound up getting picked by a small press run by all women. So, but to answer your question, I just felt like I wanted those female mentors. Um, and so that's why I was seeking out representation by another woman. I felt like she could understand my struggle, understand my story. I mean, I don't really know how to put it into words because there's certainly males out there in, in the industry who are amazing right. and they champion their authors and they're, you know, great supporters. But I felt that I needed that certain connection, especially because I write women's fiction. Mm. I needed someone to understand not only me, but my story. Okay. And my stories are about women, women coming into themselves, women against struggles, women you know, maybe with second chances. And I felt that I needed someone who could connect on all of those levels. Okay, so. that makes total sense, yeah. total sense. <laughs> so speaking about being a woman and having a book that you've got out and a few books that are coming out, yes. I wanna learn a little bit more about your process in okay. depth. So you have a family, you have yeah. children, you have a husband. So when do you find the time in your busy day to write your books? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, so very carefully. <laughs> okay. Okay. I have a husband, I have three children, I have a very nosy dog that needs a lot of attention. Okay, okay. I need to be quiet when I write. So I, yeah, I get up at five in the morning mm -hmm. and the house is dark, it's quiet, there's no cell phones, there's no emails. I light a candle, I write in my journal, and then I write for a couple of hours. Um, okay. Then the family gets up and the house is a little bit chaotic, I get everybody off on their day, and then I go back to it. Um, and I don't write at night, I know some authors do, but I, I like to just have my creativity in the morning and. Yeah, you just have to carve out time. It's not easy, and I know so many people with passion projects or side jobs or whatever f struggle to find that time. Right. And I struggled. I struggled. Where is even my place in the house that I can just right. make my own and not feel guilty about it? I think as a mother and a wife, I feel guilty if I want to carve out a certain part of the house that, you know, no, the kids can't play video games on my computer because I'm writing or whatever it is. But I think that it's time that we really carve out that spot for us, that space for us, 
because it does become sacred and it just enriches our lives, enriches our experience, and it makes us better people. That's interesting. So for anyone listening to this conversation, do you think it's necessary to be as disciplined to Mm -hmm. have a specific time, even a specific place, a specific chair, or do they just right when inspiration strikes them, do you ever sit there and say, okay, it's five in the morning and I have my morning cup of coffee or cup of tea and yeah. nothing's coming. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. What, what, what's right. some good advice you can give to someone else that's hoping to be like you? Right. Everyone's different. Every artist is different. They all have their own process. But what I always tell people who are just starting to write a book or just starting to write, um, you know, even freelance magazine work is you have to do the time you have to plant your seat in that chair and you have to just try. A lot of people say, well, the muse didn't come today or I'm not feeling it. Mm. In my personal opinion, something will come if you sit there and you're quiet enough. It might not be pretty, it might be messy, you might edit it out later, but if you sit there, something will come. And for me, that was crucial. I had to sit there every day to keep going because it's so easy to get distracted. I mean. Who doesn't need to wash that dish in the dishwasher? Who doesn't need to go run to the dry cleaner? That stuff is not important when you're trying to follow your dream and that stuff can wait. So for me, it was every day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, so once you had your book finished, and I don't know, that's another question. How do you know when your book is finished? (laughs) I mean, do you you second guess and say, I need to rewrite that chapter? I have no idea what it's like to be an author. So what do you do when you say, okay, Hand down, hands up, yeah. I'm, I'm done, I'm not writing anymore. Talk, yeah. talk a little bit about your thought process with that. Oh gosh, I think with, <laughs> again, with any artist, whether you're painting or writing, it's you could keep doing it for years, right? Okay. It's never really truly done. Okay. Um, but there does come a time where you feel that you've done all the work you can do and it's time for, for some outside perspective. Okay. Again, that's why I like to surround myself with my female agent and uh, my female editor and beta readers who are females who read my genre so um, you can find some people who read in that category and are willing to give just a teeny bit of feedback um, and just find that outside perspective again it takes a village i know that sounds like a total cliche but it does writing is such a solitary sport but if you bring other people in who can nurture you give you feedback give you good support then the journey is just that much more enhanced and i that's what i do i mean i use people to bounce ideas off of and to tell me to keep going or tell me that it's time to stop. So yeah, I definitely need people around me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is good to know. I'm learning a lot of <laughs> new things about being a writer. I think I heard along the way that you're a very visual person. Yes. And so you use visual aids. Can you talk a little bit about your process in the right. visual department? I'm, I'm a huge visual person. So okay. I do a lot of things called vision boarding. So okay. I have, um, yeah bulletin boards up above my desk in my office, and Mm -hmm. it's full of images constantly. I actually get most of my stories from an image. So I will, um, you know, for example, for the House of Bradbury, it was about Ray Bradbury's house. So I found as many images as I could, the neighborhood, the interior of the house, his house, and I'd paste them all up on the bulletin board. Oh, wow, that's kind of exciting. (laughs) Okay. And that way I'm always referring back to the image, back to the image, okay. because for me, I want to represent something the way I see it in my head, mm. but I just need that image. Um, and then when I'm done with the story, I rip it all down and I put up new images for the next book. Okay. Um, and so I always, you know, sort of use that as my guideline, if that makes sense. Okay. I love the idea of the vision board. Um, I love vision boards. I think that's a natural go-to for a lot of women. I don't know how many men use vision boards. Men can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a girl thing. Yeah, no, it's a great girl thing, and I love it because it's very effective, obviously. So how long do you leave that vision board up, and and do you really refer to that every day, and do you try and transport yourself? If you've got a photo of something, do you try and transport yourself in your mind to that photo, and then they, okay, I got an idea, and I'm going to start writing? I do. Okay. Definitely. So it's okay. So I actually have two different kinds of vision boards. If you really want to get down. I do. I want to know. I want to know. This is good stuff. Okay. So I have the vision boards for the book, right? So I have these bulletin boards that I put up behind my desk Mm -hmm. um, in my office. And for House of Bradbury, it was all about the images of the house, right? Because it was representing Ray Bradbury's house. So I had pictures of the exterior, the interior, the neighborhood. And I was always deferring back to those images because I wanted to represent it really well. Okay. It's, it's one thing to see it in your head, but it's another thing to see it on paper. And for me, I just need that. Okay. 
And then there's another kind of vision board. Okay. So this is a, not on that same bulletin board, but in a separate space. You can do Pinterest, you can do your wallpaper of your computer, whatever it is. And that's my vision board of what I want my journey to look like. So um, mm. I'm a firm believer if you visualize it, some form of it will appear. It may not be what you were expecting, but something will come from it. Okay. So I can give you an example. Uh, yes, okay. please share it with us because I love this stuff. <laughs> so I had a vision board for the House of Bradbury before it was published, before I kind of even knew the path that it would take. Mm -hmm. And I had everything from what bookstores I'd love to have my book in to what media or maybe publicity I'd love to have to some role models or people that I really admired within the industry and even outside of the industry. Okay. Just as something as like, not even a goal, but just something to know. This is sort of the energy I like. This is um, the feeling I like. Okay. These are the aspirations that I like. Right. So on that bulletin board were, was everything from palm trees and the color orange. Well, how did I know that the House of Bradbury's cover artists were going to come back with an orange book covered in palm trees. Okay, mm. that was crazy. Wow, yeah. that is interesting. <laughs> okay, so maybe you kind of manifested that a little maybe, bit. That's interesting. Maybe. And then on that board mm -hmm. was a picture of Reese Witherspoon because I love what she's done with mm -hmm. um, female authors and she's taking a lot of uh, books and turning them into wonderful films. Mm -hmm. And I think she's a great champion mm -hmm. for women just in general. She is. So I didn't really know why that was up there, but I just wanted Reese's picture up there. Okay. Maybe as inspiration. Okay. And then much later down the process, when the House of Bradbury came out and I had a publicist who got an article out that said something like five books Reese Witherspoon would totally read, and my book was one of them. Oh my gosh. And I loved that article and I tweeted it to Reese Witherspoon just mm -hmm. for fun. Mm -hmm. And instantly she retweeted it with my book cover. And I just thought, thank you, universe, because it, you know, it was just fun to have that connection. Mm -hmm. Whether it went any further than that or not, mm -hmm. it was a vision board. <laughs> but it's a vision board, and that kind of goes to show you that you have manifested a few things that were maybe in the back recesses of your mind. Yeah. No pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, but it, it, you did manifest a lot of interesting right. things that happened. So that's a great story. Yeah. I'm glad that you brought that up. Yeah, so I that's, love vision boards, yeah, that's obviously. Great. That's okay. So I love that process. Yeah. So your advice maybe to someone would be definitely put a vision board together because it's mm -hmm. going to help you with your entire process. Right. And again, you don't know where that's going to lead. It might just be helping you with your project. Right. What does my project look like? Or it might help you with the big picture. Okay. Don't forget to keep your eye on the goal, right? The goal is to be right. in this bookstore. Or the goal is to share this with this certain audience or right. whatever it is. So I have to ask, are any of the bookstores that you had on your vision board, have they carried your books? Yes, they have. Yeah. So, okay, so three <laughs> manifestations. So it really does Not work. Not every store, right? But at least right. one of them on there. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. uh, that's a great testimony yeah. for vision boards. Yes. Okay, I love that. I love that. That's something new that we, we learned today. Right, right. Okay, so let's keep talking a little bit about, we talked about your process a little bit. Now you've got your first book finished. You yes. said, I have to write this, The House of Bradbury. How did you come up with the title? So you've got the book finished, oh, yeah. now the title. Did you start with a title? Was the title at the end? How does that work? Titles are tricky for me. The House of Bradbury, the title came before I even wrote the book. Okay. I, that book was interesting. All of that just sort of came flooding through me without much thought into it. Mm. I just knew it was something that I was going to do. Okay. Um, the second book, which is The Girl Made of Clay, mm -hmm. I had such a hard time with that title. Mm -hmm. um, I was originally calling it, or I, I turned it into my publisher as The Sculptor's Daughter, because it is about a sculptor and his daughter. Right. And they felt like that was the sound of a book that could be historical fiction, which I don't write historical fiction. So that got put aside and okay. we had to sort of noodle together a new title. Titles are tricky. I don't, I admire people who come up with something just off the top of their head like that. It takes me a while. Right. So, so you like the I love the title. Thank Do you, you like the title? I love it. And I love that it's different and unique. Yes. Um, I really like things that stand out. You can just say, well, I haven't heard a title like that before. I haven't seen a book cover like that before, right. So, which is hard to do. There's a lot of books out there these days. So. Well, when I saw it, the title on your Instagram, I first of all, I love the cover. I thought it was so creative. Isn't that amazing? Yes. I know. Those cover yes. artists are great. Yes. Yeah. 
And I love the fact that the title kind of drew me in okay. because I wanted to know, well, what does that mean, the girl made of clay? Yeah. What does that really mean? And so <laughs> the title got me oh, right good. from the I'm very glad. beginning. And I'm then, glad. of course, the book, once you start reading the first few pages, you oh, just don't want to put it down. Thank so you. It's pretty thank fantastic. You. So you finished The House of Bradbury. Yeah. Talk to me about the next step. Where do you go from there? Oh, yeah. That's a good question. I have a lot of uh, writers who ask me that because it's so complicated. It's not a um, one size fits all, if you will. Okay. So I finished this book and I had two paths I could take, right? Mm -hmm. So the first was, um, do I try and get a literary agent who can introduce me to a big publisher? Okay. There's only a certain amount of big publishers that are still in existence right now and then there's a lot of small presses that are in existence as well so you and then there's self-publishing right so you kind of have three different directions you can go and they're all beneficial it just depends on what you're really wanting so um, in order to be submitted to a big publishing house they will not speak to authors directly it's sort of mm -hmm. not how it's done okay and the gatekeepers are called literary agents right okay and in order to get a literary agent, you need to impress them, they need to connect with your work, and they need to sign you. So it's kind of like a three-step process. You gotta write the book, decide if you want representation, and then decide what kind of publishing route you wanna take. So the big publishing houses require a literary agent to represent you. Okay. A small press, which is actually what I did with the House of Bradbury, um, does not need any representation you can submit and um, ask them directly if they're interested in you okay and then certainly self-publishing you take all of that responsibility on yourself and produce your your own work and um, get it out to the market that way okay so, so it's it's more complicated than we think of yes. just finishing a book and just shipping it off and hoping somebody likes it and yes. they call you how do you even find a literary agent right. that's a great question too a lot of people are confused about that because mm -hmm. it's sort of the secret society of how do you get introduced. And I'm mm -hmm. sure it's maybe the same in the music industry or, or being an actor or actress. Um, it's almost like the American Idol of writing. You have to like audition even to get a literary agent and see if oh, wow. you impress them enough because they're, ta they're taking a risk by you know, representing you and then they go on to submit you. Okay. So with the House of Bradbury, I tried both directions, right? So I tried to submit to literary agents mm -hmm. and then i also was on the side looking at some small presses that were really appealing to me okay. that i could approach directly okay now this process is not overnight <laughs> no how long did that it sounds like a lot so how lot. long did that take from okay right. i'm going to go find a literary agent and right what, what was what was that like was it right. months and months and months was it a few weeks it's months and sometimes oh, wow. it's years so um Everyone is very busy and there's so many artists and writers wanting, you know, to get their work out there that mm -hmm. it takes time. So um, what happens if you want either a large publisher or a literary agent is you have to go through a very specific process. You start with writing a query letter. And if they're interested in that letter, it has to be a very specific kind of letter mm -hmm. with a small elevator pitch, if you will, okay. and a biography. If they're interested in your letter, they say send three pages. If they're interested in your three pages, send three chapters. If they're interested in your three chapters, send the whole manuscript. It goes on and on from there. And this can take anywhere from two weeks to nine months. Oh my um, gosh. It's a long process. I've heard of authors saying it took two years before the agent who had their book actually mm -hmm. read their book and got back to them because agents are busy. And mm -hmm. um, it's difficult. It's difficult for writers. So I was going through this process with the House of Bradbury. Okay. I had one female uh, literary agent who I pitched who still stands out in my brain. She was amazing. She did take quite some time to get to my work, mm -hmm. but she read the whole book. Okay. And she took the time to write me back almost chapter by chapter of her analysis and her feedback of why it was working, why it wasn't working. And she passed on me, passed on representing that book. And it actually wasn't the House of Bradbury. I'm sorry, it was the book that's in the drawer right now. Okay. Um, but oh gosh, I appreciated that so much because it was somebody who connected with me enough to give me truthful feedback. I needed that. You know, it's, it's not enough to have your mother or your best friend read your manuscript right. and say, oh, honey, good job for you. You need truthful feedback. Right. It's the only way you're gonna get better and grow. So I've still kept in touch with that agent and I so appreciate to this day that she took the time to really comment on everything for me and help me. Um, 
with House of Bradbury is the same thing. I, I approached certain literary agents who I admired and who represented books that I liked. Okay. You have to do your research, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just submit a women's fiction to somebody who only sells science fiction. You know, you've got to find the right agent who represents your genre. And to be honest with you, I was kind of looking just for women. I wanted someone who connected with the stories I was telling mm -hmm. and who could represent me the way I thought I should be represented. Okay. Um, not that men couldn't do that. I just felt there was something about having female representation that made me feel like I would have the tribe around me that I, I wanted, I guess. Well, that makes perfect sense. If you're appealing in your market, your target market is women, then yeah. why wouldn't you get feedback directly from women? So right. that makes complete sense. Right. So it sounds like becoming a writer and trying to become a published author is a yeah. full-time job. Yeah, and is. still, I'm thinking you still have a family and everything yeah. else that you're doing. So how did you deal with once you sent things off and all the back and forth, the time between right. letters and the next phase here and there, how did you deal with maybe the anxiety or the self-doubt oh, or yeah. the stress? Because oh, yeah. that would drive me nuts waiting yes. a year or two. Yes. Am I good enough? Yeah. Does anybody like me? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that I'm not the only one. Yeah. So how do, how do you cope with that? That's, oh gosh, that's something I think a lot of struggling writers can totally relate to right. because and again, it's probably the same, I imagine, in the entertainment industry mm -hmm. or the music industry. Just because you put your work out there does not mean that everyone's going to applaud you or take right. you on right away. There's a lot of rejection. And you know, there was one funny fact that I kept reminding myself was J.K. Rowling got rejected like something like 87 times before Harry Potter series That's amazing. was accepted. That's amazing. And so I kept telling myself that, yeah. right? Um, there's a lot of rejection and it's very difficult because to me, it, it felt like a big act of bravery even trying to put mm -hmm. something on paper and expose myself in such a way that this is my story, this is what I'd like to tell. Mm -hmm. And then to have people just send you in writing, sorry, you know, not interested. Mm -hmm. I had one person reject me from a very large agency. It said, uh, we're passing and it was signed intern number one. <laughs> oh, that makes you feel special. That makes it's you feel really difficult. special. Yeah. yeah, it's a difficult process. Again, okay. it's it's trying to find that needle in the haystack. Who can connect with me? Who wants to represent me? And vice versa. Okay. Um, so did you did you want to give up at that point? Were there days when you, you got a rejection letter and maybe it was your second rejection letter or yeah. just radio silence? Yeah. Did you want to say, oh my gosh, I feel ridiculous. I put this out there. Nobody loves what right. I'm doing. It's all in my head. Right. I'm going to stop. What made you keep going right. or did you quit for a period of time? I don't know if I quit, but there was definitely days of just rejection and feeling low. And again, I didn't at that point in my career have the community of female authors around me mm -hmm. to kind of say, I went through that too. This is all part of the process. Let me read your work. Let me give you feedback. It would have been great if I did because you just need the one, the right. one author to do that. Right. I actually had an author who did that for me eventually. Mm -hmm. um, I was writing a travel blog at the time and okay. I would put in uh, vacation reads and mm -hmm. I would interview an author. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was sort of building up my community that way. Right. I found one author, um, actually reading Oprah's magazine, I found one author that was featured and I wrote her and asked if she wanted to be on my blog. And she wrote back right away and said yes. Oh, that must have felt great. Oh, it was great. So long story short is that she was on the blog, I promoted her book and I just really connected with her book. Mm -hmm. And then when I wrote my first manuscript and was hoping for feedback, I just felt compelled to write her and just ask for a bit of advice. Mm. And immediately she said, send me the book, I'll read it for you and I'll give you feedback. And oh, she had so never cool. met me. She was, you know, doing well. She was in New York. She had no reason to do that for me, but she did it. And I was so grateful. And I think there needs to be more women like that out there doing it for other people who are just looking for that bit of feedback and support. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful for that. That was mm -hmm. amazing. So. Well, that's really great. I know that you are very generous with your talents mm. and your gifts, and I know that you teach classes and that you help people yeah. along the way. So I think that's terrific. So you're kind of paying it forward because someone did yeah. it for you. So paying I think it forward that's a good is so element. important. Yeah. I mean, truly, I think we should all do that. That is how I got to where I am, and I, I would love to do that for other people. Yeah. Well, that's great. I, I know I, I, I've talked to a few people that have taken your classes and they oh. actually loved it. And they said that it was a godsend because they oh, wanted to good. quit and give up and you inspired them to keep going. Thank so you. I like that. Thank you. 
Well, let's talk a little bit more now. So okay. we, we learned about the House of Bradbury. We learned about your process with getting that up and running. And you finally got to a publisher that would take your book on. So that process, you said, took about nine months, perhaps? Perhaps. Start to finish? Yeah. So I wound up not going with a literary agent and not mm -hmm. a big publisher for mm -hmm. my first book. Mm -hmm. I wound up getting introduced to a small press that was run all by women, mm -hmm. and they published women's fiction. Mm -hmm. And it was just lovely, and it was meant to be. Mm -hmm. So they signed me. They published my book. They did wonderful PR. It was very author-centric and a lot of back and forth, you know, um, collaboration. I loved it. It was amazing. Bradbury came out, mm -hmm. and then I got some more um, attention, I guess. Um, I got some lovely press from that, and a couple literary agents found me, and I actually found one that I liked, and I got a few offers of representation. Nice. And I, I chose one that I felt was the greatest fit for me, and she's lovely. My agent's amazing. Okay. Um, and then from there, she pitched my next book and I got a bigger publisher and a two book deal from that publisher. Wow. Yeah. So that's fantastic. Yeah. So that just goes to show you vision board. Yeah. Don't give up <laughs> persistence. Yeah. You never quit. Yeah. So that is amazing. Yeah. So yeah. your second book, The Girl Made of Clay. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the inspiration for that book because it's actually, I loved your first book. This Thank one you. is even more exciting than the first book Thank now that you. I've read it. So I can't wait to see. I think it's going to evolve <laughs> over time. But. They're very different. Yeah, yeah the books are. are very different. Yeah. And I hope, I think, again, I keep saying this, but with any artist, mm -hmm. the more you do your craft, the more you work at it, I hope to keep evolving. Mm -hmm. I hope my writing gets better with each book. I'll always love that first book because it was my first book. Right. But I do like the process of just maybe getting better and better with each time or maybe learning more about my own writing process with each time. So yeah, I'm really excited about The Girl Made of Clay. All right, so tell us a little bit about where did you get the idea? Where was the inspiration for okay. The Girl Made of Clay? Because it's a very okay. interesting story. Thank you. So this one, as you know, is a mm -hmm. family drama. It's mm -hmm. a little bit more emotional than mm -hmm. my first book. Mm -hmm. It's obviously fictional. Right. Um, so to be honest, the uh, inspiration for this book came from a couple different pieces of my own background. This book is in no way autobiographical, but okay. it did come from my background. So when I was six years old, my mom took me to the scene of a fire. Um, this was back in 1979, so that kind of gives you okay. an idea of how old I am. Okay. But my mom at the time was really involved in the art community in Southern California, and um, she was raising money for and volunteering for a school of art that was in a canyon on the coast. Um, and overnight, it suffered a terrible fire. Oh. And she, I remember being six, I don't remember everything, but I remember this very vividly that she got the phone call and put me in the car and drove me up there. And it was pretty much right after the fire had been put out. Um, it's now a four-year art college, but at the time it was just starting off and it was devastating to the people who started that college. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of valuable paintings were burned, all the records were burned, the administration building, the library. It was a big deal. It was a big fire. It was a big fire. And just arriving on the scene and smelling that charred ash and just seeing all the devastation. And to my six-year-old brain, realizing for the first time, this is someone's artwork that has been destroyed and is never going to return. Oh, that was so powerful. So I kept that memory with me. Um, and around the same time, my father was really involved in uh, sculpting, clay sculpture work. Okay. And he didn't do it for a career, but he did it for a hobby, kind of like a passion project. Right. So my dad actually built a house and he built a clay studio on the property. Okay. So when I was maybe six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, I spent time in there with him. And I will never forget that, it was so lovely. So just all that earthy, wet clay and all of the like tools with the wooden handles that mm -hmm. you just wanna to touch, you mm -hmm. know? And um, just being in that environment that someone could take a block of clay and create it into something, right. you know, kind of something out of nothing, really stuck with me. So take those two memories and put them together, and it kind of feeds into the inspiration for The Girl Made of Clay. Okay. <laughs> all right. Now it becomes, when you read the book, it, it all makes sense. Yeah. So, so the okay. book, for people who haven't read it, is obviously about a sculptor. Mm -hmm and his house suffers a terrible fire, mm -hmm. and he's forced to go live with his estranged adult daughter, and mm -hmm. she needs to care for him. Um, so those 
things did not happen necessarily in my life, but that was sort of the catalyst for the storyline. Okay. So, All right. Yeah. So was this, I'm curious, this was your second official book, I guess we yes. can call it. Yes. Um, so did this process come easier because mm -hmm. you've already been through it once, well, actually twice before yeah. with your first yeah. test, test manuscript? Yes. Um, was it easier for you? Did it flow easier? Did you have a better framework or was the process completely different? Different. Okay. Very different. So writers have this word in the community called a panster versus a plotter. Okay. <laughs> it's a term, I guess. Okay. Okay. So for House of Bradbury, I was a complete panster, okay. which means writing by the seat of your pants. <laughs> all right. Okay. Now I understand. There was no process at all. I just sat down and had to get that story out as fast as it came to me. Okay. I didn't know who the characters were going to be, what the plot line was going to be. Just I sat down and just sort of like channeled through me for a better mm -hmm. term, lack of a better term. Um, and then with The Girl Made of Clay, mm -hmm. I was much more methodical and I plotted it and I wrote a synopsis. I mean, I, to be honest, I had a larger publisher who sort of required a little bit more from me rather than just saying, I'll wing it. You okay. Know? <laughs> okay. All right. So I was maybe even more professional with my approach of how am I going to structure the story and how am I going to put it together? So two very different processes. Was it easier when you had more structure? I guess a more formal mm. structure is what I'm hearing. Is, is that an easier process when you have a structure or yeah. it's just? Not necessarily. Okay. It's, you know, for creative people, it's hard to be creative on a schedule or hard to be creative right. when it's very regimented. Right. Some people love to plot and outline and be very specific and other people like to just go as the muse comes. Okay. I loved both processes, but I, I don't think that it was any easier. That's for sure. So The Girl Made of Clay is really a fascinating story. I personally would love to see it made into a movie. Oh, me too. So have you ever thought about if you could have your dream cast, oh, yeah. who, would, who would play the father? Who would play the daughter? Have you yeah. even thought about that? I have thought about it. So the whole time I was writing, uh, TR, who is the father in the mm -hmm. story, mm -hmm. I kind of modeled it after Jeff Bridges, who was yeah. in the movie Crazy Heart. Mm -hmm. I thought he did such a great job. Okay. Um, and then I'm in love with Jessica Chastain right She's now. Great. I would kill to have her play Sarah in the movie. That yeah. would be a very interesting dynamic. <laughs> I would pay good money to see that. So a question I have, I'm very curious. Um, is there anything about being a female author that you think might be a little different? Is your approach different? Is mm. your reaction different from your readers or your publishers or your editors? Right. Is there anything that is tweaked a little bit right. um, being a female versus being a male? How does that right. affect your work? That's so interesting you bring that up because, of course, I have so many people in my corner supporting me mm -hmm. and promoting me. But when it comes to the media and when it comes to perceiving uh, authors, whether mm -hmm. it's fiction, nonfiction, memoir, whatever it mm -hmm. is, I do feel that there's still a little bit of bias. I'll give you an example. So if you were reading um, a magazine article that wanted to recommend uh, fiction reads of the year, top mm -hmm. 10 books of the year, they would title it that way when they put a lot of male authors. But if there's female authors, for some reason, the media likes to put that in the title. So instead of saying the top 10 books of the year, they'll say the top 10 books of the year written by women. It's just for some reason, why can't fiction be fiction and nonfiction be nonfiction? You know, a book is a book. That's right. I do feel that they're qualifying in a way that doesn't need to be qualified. Let's all be recognized equally and just, you know, it's an even playing field. So let's see it that way. So in this whole process, what did you discover about yourself? Oh, yeah. I discovered how to be brave and that I could be brave. This was probably something that I really had to face. Can I put my work out there? Mm -hmm. Can I stand behind it with courage without all the self-doubt that I carried into it when I first started writing manuscripts? I learned how to step into myself, you know, become myself and finally be able to say who, what I wanted to say and express who I really am. So it was huge. <laughs> so the validation, obviously, is having your book, not just the first book, the second book, and, a, and yeah. another book on its yeah. way. So how does that make you feel? You actually were brave enough to step out and say, here I am, this is my work. Yeah. How does it feel now? Does it feel any different? Does it feel like you thought it would feel? It does and it doesn't. It feels wonderful and it is validation. And it's so exciting when somebody writes me a personal email or comes up to me at book signing and says, you know, this is the impact your book had on me. I love that to death. Um, but there's always going to be those times where I'll have self-doubt and think, is this good enough? Am I good enough? 
Is it worth it? And that's again, when you lean on your tribe of people mm -hmm. and you know, hopefully they will give you honest feedback and support you. And it's important to have that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. with this second book, yeah. now you've got more structure, but you have a bigger publishing house involved. Right. Is there a deadline set for the second book? Right. Do you feel a lot of pressure? Are there a lot more eyes on you and expectations? Is that whole right. process feeling different to you by this time? Yeah, it definitely feels different. Um, with House of Bradbury, there was no timeline, no contract, no pressure. Mm -hmm. I just did that for me. And it felt so good. If anyone has a chance to do something just for themselves, to see if they could even do it, mm -hmm. it feels so good. And it's such a unique, authentic experience that no one can take away from you, right? Because you're just doing it to prove something to yourself. Right. Um, and now, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I have a contract and I have um, publishers to make happy and sales numbers that I would like to meet. Um, so it is a different feeling and it could go either way, right? So I'm feeling really proud and excited, but I also feel nervous and it's a different kind of pressure. So yeah, I mean, it's a different experience altogether. So pressure for most people and creativity don't go together. <laughs> did, did it, did it, do you think it kind of crimps your creativity or were you able to work past that? Do you have your, a way to work past that? Oh gosh, both. Okay. Right. Writing on someone else's deadline is not easy. Right. Um, because the muse doesn't always come. Right. But, um, it also is validation. Like someone else, actually a room full of people think that you're worth it to put their money into you and their time into you and promote you. So, you know, you rise to the occasion. You would like to prove them right. And it feels good. So a little of both. <laughs> Obviously it worked because this book is terrific. It's terrific. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Well, so is there another book in the works? Oh, do you have is. something yeah. coming? Yes, I do. Can you share anything with us about the next book? A little bit. It is untitled, but uh, with my new publisher, who's Lake Union, which is actually uh, the book club imprint for Amazon Publishing. Congratulations. Um, thank you. So it's a two book contract. So I the Girl Made of Clay was the first book with them, and then I have a second one coming out mm -hmm. uh, fall of 2019. Okay. And that one's untitled, and I'm really excited about it, but that's kind of all I can say right now. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Well, we can, <laughs> we can work with the Girl Made of Clay first okay. for a while, so that's terrific. Okay. So this has been wonderful learning Thank a little you. bit more about this. Is there any extra advice that you'd like to give some right. aspiring writers out there? What can you tell them? Do you have any... Yeah words of wisdom that we haven't discussed already today that you'd like to share? I would. So I would say find your community. And whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, it does not matter because the beauty of online is that you can find those forums online. You don't have to mm -hmm. put yourself out there and pump the flesh and meet people eye to eye. You can certainly do that at conferences if you want to. Right. Writers conferences are a great, great way to do that. But there's online communities of writers who will swap work and give each other critiques. There's writers communities who just give advice. You can you know, ask questions. I actually belong to Women's Fiction Writers Association, which is an amazing community of female authors who really support each other, critique each other's work, encourage each other to do certain marketing things or attend these programs, give classes. Find your tribe, find your community, because it helps so much not to do it all by yourself. That's fantastic information. Yeah. I have learned about how to become an author just through this conversation. <laughs> so I'm, I hope that other people will find this oh, infor good. information very helpful. Good. Thank you. So last but not least, let's talk a little bit about where we can find your books, oh, yeah. because I know that once everyone sees this, uh, they must pick up a couple copies of your books and read them. <laughs> yeah. Start with The House of Bradbury, okay. definitely, and then go to The Girl Made of Clay. So where can they find your books? So um, indie bookstores, Barnes & Noble, mm -hmm. and very easily Amazon online. Mm -hmm. And you can order um, Audible versions or paperback or ebook. Um, but yeah, hopefully any online retailer will have it. So, I love that. Yeah. And, if, and if you're watching this right now, you can also click on the link below and we'll take you to the site where you can buy any one of Nicole Meyer's fantastic novels. And we're so happy that you joined us today. Thank so you. Thank I you loved it. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning into the Mentors and Moguls podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, rate and review this interview and share it with a friend who could benefit from today's guest. You can find bonus video episodes at mentorsandmogulspodcast.com or check out our events page and our blog at heatherrstone.com. 
Until next time, make it a great day. Thank you.